good afternoon everyone oh what a beautiful day here in Southern California hopefully you guys are all doing well and I'm in a very special location as I mentioned to you I am in off of Venice Boulevard in West Los Angeles in a place known as race service and you see there some pretty cool cars all around here there's on a bunch of conifer who did the wonderful stuff on the red uh, 930 935 I should say that we did recently and um, we are here to do some amazing things and to interact with you as well ghosts if I toys asking, do we do B series cams? Yes, we do. What's the fastest I've been in Mexico? Um, I would say the fastest in terms of speed would be 165. Most horsepower car I've ever built. So at first, I would say it's the blue um, IROC Porsche because it shut down my dyno. I never really had the opportunity to take a look and see. Um, but what I've documented, believe it or not, is a Hyundai. We did a rear wheel drive converted. Hyundai Santa Fe about three years ago and that made 1170 um, it was almost 1200 horsepower which is pretty cool um, what inspires me to make uh, such unique builds and how do I justify this is Oscar Windham um, well believe it or not I just like to solve problems and that's honestly the God honest truth what, what happens I just solve problems um, it's a challenge in mobility or speed or going faster or reliability that's my goal is to make that come to life so that's really what inspires me, is problem solving. Um, in this case, even with the 935 behind me, the K3B, we have this, you know, I have this old vehicle that was abandoned, pretty much. Singer barn, what could I do to have a lot of fun without the guilt? What could I do to have a lot of speed and power without feeling guilty of polluting? And this was the result of that. So, and justification, really, initially, it's immensely expensive to do these builds. And the justification is the products that come in light of that. So if you go to BC More Web Store, you see so many products, and the majority of those came from creating projects like that, being able to solve problems and create products. And if there are things that we cannot do in-house, we partner with good companies that can bring those to life as well. So I just came from AEM before coming here, and they're one of our good technical partners, and I don't have the capability of doing circuit boards in-house, but AEM does. So that being said, it is great, you know? Um, Miss Alamanka says, I love what you did with the Veloster N. You inspired me to mod my end. You should. It's so good. Those cars are so amazing. And what I like about the Veloster N, it has so much potential and opportunity. And it doesn't have that boy racer look that you see with other cars in this segment. So it looks very elegant. A lot of German influence. You can feel that in the steering and the drivability. And even with the backfire and the pop and bangs that comes from the factory setup. Um, how do you open your own shop and get going? So Cushing Bitch, that's a very, very good question and a very challenging one indeed. It is a very grueling and competitive marketplace. So opening up a, a business in terms of automotive being performance, high performance in particular, it's extremely challenging and challenging because there's so many players in that marketplace. I noticed that you only have to do one or two things. Either you set yourself apart by doing crazy, ridiculous stuff, like what you may see behind me, or you do some really nice, I would say, rebuilds and restoration and factory maintenance anything in between seems to be a bit of a challenge and so many shops especially now with the whole COVID thing going on um, high performance is more of a luxury than I would say a necessity so it's a bit of a challenge and if you haven't had any experience in that market at all I would encourage you to dedicate your time even for free intern in a shop that's similar to what you want to do get exposure experience and see if this is really what you want to do because it's a lot of gruesome hours I myself uh, shame on me and my family suffers for this. I work every day. I'm in the office seven days a week. I never take vacation. You guys have seen me on Tech Tuesday here. When have you ever seen me say, I'm going on vacation? I just don't do it. And it's what is the time I have to put in, the, the, the dozens and dozens of hours a day that I have to put in to be able to make things successful for all of us and my team. You know? Good morning, 911 Motorsports. Good seeing you. My first build was an 88 Honda CRX HF, which actually put me on the map because I hone my teeth in high RPM small displacement engines, you know? What's up, BC? Take my snot nose and make a sister to yours. t War, I am so down. I love projects like that. DM me your budget and also your timelines and we can make it happen. No problems, you know? Um, what qualities would it make a good for a good turn in a BC model? I would say someone who is very open-minded, who's technically savvy, and someone who's actually quite hardworking. Those are really very few criteria. It's not too challenging. You know, all things being equal that we look for in interns, you know? Hey, BC says, Jay, did you ever work on a bike? You know what's so weird, Jay? You said that. Are you a spy, Jay? Anyway, the reason why I say that is because I was commissioned to build a bike for SEMA this year. And it's for the Turbinex booth, actually. But Turbinex ended up pulling back. 
So that being said, it won't be happening this year. So I have not. Hello, 911 Motorsport. And that was going to be my first foray. It was going to be like a, a small, like, mini bike with a turbo and some tuning and some really cool stuff, but it didn't happen. I'm doing well, 911 Motorsport. I hope you're doing great as well. Oh, all the way from Port Harcourt. I'm Inonso. Thank you so much for joining. I'm Inonso from Port Harcourt, Nigeria. Good seeing you. Nigeria is where I'm from. I love it. Ooh, Parse. Good seeing you. Thank you so much. I've been trying to find your V-Series cams. can't find anything. So go subscribe to me performance. We do that on a custom basis. So if you go to the website, you won't see it. There are a lot of products we have. So weird. I was just talking to my good friend today, uh, Sean Matthews from, from the UK, about this. There are a lot of products that I have in-house that we custom make for teams that we don't advertise for public consumption in the site. So if you really want it, goes, send me a DM here or give a call or email to the shop, and then we'll get it going for you. And we can make a custom profile for you. We have over 68 different profiles for the B-Series VTEC. So that being said, we have something. If it's something that we have that doesn't take your fancy, let me know, and we can customize something just for you without qual. Um, any luck with uh, scoring a Mazda RX-7 build? Um, I did have one. I did have an, um, an FD chassis that came in, but I ended up selling it to a gentleman who wanted to build it very quickly because I couldn't get to it. One of the reasons why you don't see any Mazda builds in our facility is because we don't have a relationship with Mazda yet. We're building cars. And when you see stuff from Honda and from Ford and from you know Hyundai, that's because the partnership exists between us and the manufacturer. And it makes things very good for us to be able to build something new. And in this case, if I did something with Mazda, something old. So if I did something with Mazda, don't be surprised if we did a newer uh, MX-5 and then also did an old school RX-3, RX-7. So it depends on our relationship with the manufacturer indeed, you know? Have your cars been in video games since the Everything Post 124? Absolutely it has. As a matter of fact, there's a gentleman in that room back there. His name is Rod Chung, and he was instrumental in getting not only my IROC Porsche, but myself in the Need for Speed franchise. So we filmed that about half a decade ago, and it was a very realistic episode where they had legends from around the world come together. So in that game, you have myself, you have Nakai from RWB, you have um, Magnus Walker, you have Ken Block, you have Steph Papadakis. There are quite a few of us in that, and it was pretty cool, you know? Thank you so much, Inhil Axel. Says I love my comment indeed. I appreciate that. Thanks so much. Ever done anything on 944? No, I have not. Only because I typically do things in the Porsche world based upon the client and their desire. So if I have a 944 client comes in and wants to do something, I am so game. But at this point, I have not had a client come in for a 944 build. Um, our builds are pretty involved and pretty crazy. And I think 944 guys tend to shy away from that kind of mindset. But that doesn't mean it can be possible. I would love, and Corvo, you'll love this, I would love to be able to infuse similar EV technology in this into a 944, but I just need to find the right client to make that happen. Hmm? Um, oh, the Model 3 rear unit, oh, okay. Um, 300 kilowatts before Mars is pretty nice. Um, I have not got my hands on one of those units, but I'll take a look, I'll take a look. I have not even thought about using that. Um, I've been playing around with um, a lot of the large and small drive units. Uh, turbo supercharger, which one is better? It depends on your goal, slow SI13. So here is the BC's rule of thumb when it comes to those different types of, of, of force induction. For individuals who love, and I see this a lot with some of my clients, the whine of a supercharger and the feel of a supercharger was absolutely no lag because it makes the engine feel like a large natural aspirated setup or if there are challenges with heat in the engine bay, supercharging is the way to go. Um, it's a direct cog between the crankshaft and also the impeller blade on the supercharger, so you have immediate, immediate induction of air. As a matter of fact, some superchargers at idle tend to vent so it doesn't push air into the engine at idle. That's how efficient some of the modern day superchargers are. Um, the challenges with supercharging, however, is in nature of its application, right? And what that means is it takes energy to turn a supercharger. It takes energy to push air into the engine. So you may have a 480 horsepower supercharged setup of which 50 horsepower is being consumed by the supercharger itself being turned by the crankshaft. While turbocharging on the other hand is great because turbocharging is more modular. You have the opportunity to be able to place the turbos in locations that are ideal for the engine bay. You can crank the boost up and have different modes in terms of boost based upon gear or speed. Um, you could have a 300 horsepower today and if the engine can handle it, 400 tomorrow, 600 the next day. You have the capability of doing all those cool things and you're using, in a perfect world, wasted energy to turn it. 
So you now have this exhaust system that where there's wasted energy in terms of heat and mass airflow of air and, and, and also uh, radiation that turns the, compress the uh, compressor wheel via a direct cog to the exhaust wheel. So they tend to be more efficient. So you don't tend to get the parasitic loss you see with, with supercharging. So it depends on what your goals are. You want immediate, no lag, supercharge the way. Or if you have an engine bay with heat management issues, like the S2000 is a popular one. To do a proper turbo system, you have to relocate your fuse box and relocate your battery. But if you want supercharged, you don't have to worry about that. And you have this cool sound of a large NA setup. While the turbocharger, because of how the exhaust wheel sits in exhaust flow, does a good job in maybe attenuating some of the sounds. So you can actually many times get away with a turbocharged setup without even a muffler. Because the turbine wheel is a great attenuation device. Eh? Great questions, you know? Northwest Territories, Canada, courtesy of Stewie Beasy. Good seeing you. Um, I mentioned you at BMW McKenna. Do you work with them still, says Ron's World. It's so weird. Today must be a great psychic day because I, believe it or not, spoke to Mel Mayuga at McKenna today. So uh, order some parts today. So I still do work with them quite a bit. Absolutely. You know? Um, Cushion Bitch, you must have missed my comment. I did have a very big comment on how to get your shop going. So uh, this will be up here on Instagram indefinitely. I am filming right now for YouTube, and that will be up on YouTube indefinitely as well. And uh, feel free to listen to it again. Netflix says, I saw you on Hyperdrive on Netflix. And that was no way. Yes, that was fun. We were in New York, Rochester for two months filming the uh, that Charlize Theron's uh, directed show where it was like American Ninja Warrior meets like Fast and Furious. It was pretty crazy. And uh, some people got hurt, cars got damaged, but it was a fun ride, a fun two months filming that. So I think they signed for more seasons, so I look forward to even more carnage coming. The funny thing is that when we filmed that, we had no idea, no idea, guys, what type of racing it was. So you had cars that were like drag cars that we brought, what uh, uh, Saul from SOS and I took there was this LS swapped turbocharged Z. Um, there were guys with exotics. There was a Viper that came by, a Corvette. Um, uh, the guys from AMS brought a Lamborghini out, so we had no idea. And then there were quite a few drifters, and I guess the drift cars really raised supreme because it was really, the truck was set up for them. So it was really good, you know? Isn't it making uh, the batteries for electric vehicles more of an impact on the environment than gas engines? Absolutely not real red for you. And, you know, I used to hear that as well prior to me getting into this. And then what I uncovered, I need to dedicate to an entire Tech Tuesday by itself, is very, very scary what some of the gas companies have done to put, to really go out of their way to put the EV world in negative light. Um, there is a documentary, I think, on Netflix, like, Who Killed the Electric Car? If you have a chance, look, just, just watch that video. Maybe a little boring for some people, but it has some good information. And it's frightening how powerful all your companies are and how powerful they are in trying to make this new age means of mobility slow down or go away. So no, um, it's actually not true at all. As a matter of fact, um, even petrol engines use batteries and many of them use lead acid till today. And those are pretty crazy as well, you know? Snow for Run says, I love how you can explain very difficult subjects in easy to understand form. That's a skill many do not have. Thank you so much, Snow for Run. And uh, I appreciate the kind words. As an engineer, I have the capability of chopping up with my peers at a high level, but I'm not one of those engineers that want to talk over my audience to come across as intelligent. Um, it's my goal to break things down so we all can explain it and, or, or enjoy it and understand. Um, and you know, that's why many times you hear me use analogies, like even when talking about hem holes and wave propagation, I talk about dropping a pedal in a pond. Um, when I talk about safety, I talk about like, like muscle building, you know, like working on the gym and how you know, it's so sad that you have these cars with engine management solutions, the cars are beautiful and they're gorgeous paint and then you, you take a look at the ECU and it's rubbish. And I use that as, oh, you work out, you eat well, and then your brain is just, just rubbish. You know, it's, it's so many things. It's my goal to make it engineering fun and allow people to understand very, very well, you know? Have a great week as well, T-War. Thank you so much. Anything that works for the 10th gen Honda? Um, we did quite a bit. So with American Honda, we had access to the SI, 10th gen, and even Type R pre-production. So that being said, we've done quite a bit with that. But if you're talking about new products moving forward, that market is, has a lot, a lot of products already. So I may just leave it as is. I don't have any plans for doing that uh, uh, anytime soon, you know? 
Is it bad for the internals of a stock engine to run E85? Absolutely not, Dean Davidson. As a matter of fact, if you look a little bit south of the United States, way south, in Brazil, they hate relying on foreign oil. So lots of sugar cane, lots of biomass. They run every car on a large percentile of ethanol. So the one danger, one danger of running ethanol in stock or modified internal combustion engines is being able to protect the internal components properly. And not all oils are compatible with E85. As a matter of fact, I've seen really scary data when I uh, start doing my own experiments on conventional oils or even fairly popular ones and how easy they disintegrate or froth or just go to blazes when it comes to any contact with an ethanol or alcohol-based fuel or any fuel with an OH radical. So that being said, um, I, I dug up high and fine. You can see I love these guys. I, I represent them on my hat, on my cars. I, I love them a lot. The Pure guys, they, they know their stuff. It's an aerospace company. They deal with a lot of, you know, I would say heat and chemical resilience that we don't see in automotive because they're big aerospace guys. And that oil is what I use. And it has amazing resilience to ethanol and methanol. It's even on the bottle. So by all means, I would encourage you. The one thing, D, um, D, Dean Davidson, is yes, you can use E85, but please upgrade your oil, and I recommend Pure Oil. I really do. That's what you should do, you know? When in high school, did you race in open track day or formal race, uh, racing series? So Williams, no. Um, when I was in high school, I didn't even know anything about cars. And if you remember, I was one of those weird engineering students or the weird students. I skipped a lot of grades. So I really didn't graduate high school. I skipped grades and entered university when I was 15. So um, even when I was in university for the first year, I didn't do any racing at all. It's only when I came to the United States to finish up my curriculum is when I started racing, indeed, you know? The guy behind you is Super Saiyan. That's so funny. <laughs> I saw that. He has pretty cool hair. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, what concerns should you consider on automobiles pre-2000 when looking to switch fuel systems from 91, 93 to 85? So, Texas Holyfield, it depends on the manufacturers. So, some manufacturers adopted better um, lines than others. But whenever I build a car that is, for me, I'm crazy, right? Pre-2001, I automatically get rid of all the fuel lines and replace them with Teflon line lines. So you have companies like um, uh, Vibrant that make lines that are Teflon that you can purchase from your local seed shop or distributor or you can get directly or get on Amazon. Um, if you have a local facility, we are lucky to have G&J out in Ontario, California. They have Teflon line, they have braided holes that Teflon line inside. So that's what I tend to do. I definitely get rid of all the old rubber components. Um, I get rid of any paper filters that may exist. And a lot of companies, a lot of manufacturers use paper filters for fuel. And they tend to disintegrate very, very badly with, the, uh, with ethanol. And um, of course, injectors, I upgrade those as well. So I hope that helps, you know? Oh my goodness. Thank you for the explanation about the cam, says Passengers Opinion. My pleasure indeed. I am here to help. I'm here, as you many of you remember, to be that person that I needed when I came to America. When I came here, I wanted to learn about cars. I wanted to figure out how to modify my stuff. No one, I really didn't get that much help. And I needed me when I was younger. And I'm trying to be that, definitely, you know? Um, your tolerance to explain thoroughly and answer, repeat question is second to none. Don't worry about signing any type of way. Thank you so much, Dreamy Life. I appreciate the kind words, you know? How do you feel about turbocharging the F20B? And if you mean F20B Honda, which is like the overseas Accord, amazing. I love that so much that we have custom pistons made just for the application, custom pistons and rods. So that being said, if you need F20B rods or pistons, we made a ton of them. And we sold quite a few too. I think it's still on the website. Hmm. Anyway, yes, I like them very much, you know? Dodge on 911R, awesome. 1967, oh, 911 Motorsport, you're good. I'll tell you my thoughts on 911R. I have a 1967 912 that came to me as a project that um, I pretty much saved. And I, what I mean by saved, I bought it from Northern California. I really wanted the engine. The, um, it's, it's kind of scary. Uh, this chassis was a beautiful silver, but I'm explaining to you how atrocious this thing was. 67 912. The side rear fenders of a 930, the wing from a 930, original wing by the way, the rear valence bumpers and lights of a 964, and the front end of a 993 turbo. Crazy, right? So I saw this car and it had a 3.6 engine in it, it had a proper 964 engine, 
made it to a 901 gearbox. So this thing was just, it was just, and the whole interior was 4993. So I got this car and got rid of the fenders, cut it off, sold the wing, got rid of the rear valence, sold the whole front end, which was all factory original, right? Got rid of the front headlights, all that stuff. Got rid of the interior. I, they converted from a three to a, eight, a five pod. I may just keep the five pod in place. And one thing they did that pushed me towards a 911 hour, they shaved the, the gutters. You know the little rain gutters that exist on top of 911s? And some racers take them off for aerodynamics because it's an advantage, but the purists hate when you take those off. So the fact that it was shaving, it now relegated the car to become a, a bit of an outlaw. So my goal is to give the slight you know, the 67, 912, the 911s had a straight fender, but 911 all had that slight little career fender flare coming out. My goal is to create my own outlaw 67 911R because I find those cars so fascinating. I may even do the road cage, that weird, you know, they didn't have good radius bending then, so it's a wide radius cage. I may do the same thing. I think the 911R was like the epitome for the 60s of a pure race car, lightweight driver. It was just an amazing car. So I love it, you know? That cuts the dog. So whenever weight or power is slightly removed, it kicks out of gear. So the best way to shift the dog box without a strain gauge is to, as you're in power, blip the throttle. As you blip the throttle, you, sh you pull. With commitment. You don't granny shift, because that's how you kill dogs. You blip the throttle and with commitment pull. So if many of you haven't seen this and haven't had a chance, go on the BC Moto YouTube page, subscribe, Look for BC Moto Insight. Listen to my car. You see me shifting? It sounds like a bike or some crazy sequential. No, it's an H pattern and me blipping the throttle. And that's how you do it. Hey, BC, what are the advantages and disadvantages of rev hang? And why do new cars have a side from emissions control and it's a harm for the engine to remove rev hang? So first, advantage of rev, advantage of rev hang is, dude, your car, when you shift, your RPMs don't fall as much. You can Fall back in a power band, it's amazing. Race car drivers do it. AJ taught me how to do it, he's a great guy. It's amazing. Disadvantages is, if you are not very good at doing it yourself, it can actually slow you down. The factory ECU is doing it, like the Nissans, and the new Type R, the new SI, and the Veloster N, it's amazing. Um, it is not harmful at all, and many setups allow you to disable. And that's one thing I like about the Veloster N, you can disable it in cabin. Um, with some of the other cars, you can have to disable it through flashing the ECU. But I actually like it. I like the sound. Um, some people don't like the sound. But um, I don't think it's really an emissions thing. It's more of a performance attribute or advantage. Yeah? Thank you so much, 911 Motorsport. I appreciate it indeed. South African, the passenger's opinion. Stacey Sis, good seeing you. I have a girl in the back. G views go up. Oh, uh, you're so, you guys, you know. That's actually Maryland. She's a good girl. She's nice back there. Actually, there are quite a few ladies there. Um, hello, TFT Scott. Good seeing you. Columbia's in the house. When are we going to build a Porsche motor? AJ, you know last time you were, you, you saw me? I haven't even finished the Cayman motor. It's still on the stand. It's just, I am so crazy busy. I can't even touch my own project. So, AJ, I will let you know. I haven't even... Put the, I haven't even put the oil pan on the gray Porsche. So sad. And on that note, guys, I, I do have to depart. Um, and they're making noise back there, so I need to join. I'm quite hungry, actually. So thank you so much for joining me today. I'm going to have this up here on Instagram indefinitely. I really appreciate you, and thank you so much to the guys here at Race Service for allowing me to use our wonderful facility to be able to do Tech Tuesday. Sorry I'm in a bit of a dark. It's quite sunny out here. But um, stay safe, guys. Keep in touch. And if there are any way that you guys can suggest I can make this even a better application, let me know. I am here to help. Take care, everyone. Stay safe. See you soon. Cheers.